Okay, today I'm going to talk to you about the hidden parts of salvation. In plainer words, there are certain things that are part of salvation that you aren't going to understand when you first get saved. They are revealed later. Um, hidden parts of salvation. Okay. I'm going to write things out here so people can remember. Um, first, we're going to talk about the known things. In other words, certain things that you will know when you truly get saved. Things that you will understand that, you know, salvation is about. Number one, we have the knowledge of sin. Anybody that's ever gotten saved has understood their personal sin has uh, got them in trouble with the Lord. And they need a payment for that sin. Number two, we have coming judgment. I'm going to write everything out here at the beginning. Coming judgment. Anybody that's ever lived They've done things in their life that they're afraid about being judged about. That's why they get offended when a Christian starts to judge them. Don't you judge me. Who are you to judge me? You know? Number three. Holy Scripture. Okay? Okay? Most people, especially living today, have heard of the Bible. They might not have read it. They might be against it or hate it or whatever. But the point is, they know that there's a book out there that's called Holy Scripture, the Holy Bible. Okay? Now, the hidden things. I'll show you these quick. The things that you aren't going to understand when you first get saved. But they're there. Number one, you have the blood atonement. The blood atonement of Jesus Christ is certainly part of your salvation, but it is not something that you're going to understand as a lost person. We'll get more into this and I'll show you the scriptures. Number two, imputed righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is applied to your account when you get saved. But you aren't going to get that. You aren't going to understand that until after you're saved, until you're born again, and then the Holy Spirit starts to show you some of this stuff. Number three, you have sanctification. Or more, another way to say it would be a changed life. Okay? So there we have that. Number four. We have the deity of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to say that Jesus Christ... is 100% God. He's not a third of God or one of three persons in the God, the Trinity or something. No, no, no. He is 100% God. More on that as we continue. And number five, the fifth hidden thing that you might not fully understand when you first get saved is eternal security. Okay, there. Now my chart's all written out, and the poor people out there that are false converts, uh, now you can see what I'm going to be covering, and you can start screaming heresy and whatever else. 
can't post any comments because I just want you dealing with uh, the Lord. You know, pray about these things and whatever else. And of course, make your little stupid videos against me. But, you know, you can shut the video off now that you've seen what things I'm going to be covering if you're a heretic. If you love the Lord, if you're trying to find out about the Bible, excuse me, drop, as I drop the marker, <laughs> if you're trying to find out about the Lord and the Bible and things, well then, stay tuned. We're going to go through the Scriptures. Unlike a lot of people, I'm actually going to tell you, get a King James Bible and open your King James Bible to these Scriptures, and I'm going to show you scriptural support for all this. All right? Don't just sit there looking at the screen. Get a King James Bible. Pause the video now. Go get a King James Bible. You say, I don't have one. Okay, go to some Bible gateway or some kind of thing like that or whatever else and look at the King James Bible online and follow along to make sure I'm not lying to you. One of the marks of a false prophet is that they are just going to go blah, blah, and they're just going to, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, and they're never going to tell you to turn in your Bible. You aren't going to get that much here. I will quote scripture from time to time, but I would say nearly every video I've ever done, I'm telling you to turn your Bible when it's a teaching type of a thing like this. That's the point of this ministry. This is King James Video Ministries. This is not Brian Denlinger on YouTube trying to get a good Facebook following. Okay. This is King James Video Ministries. Dot com. I have a website. I've been in ministry longer than I've been on YouTube. I use YouTube to get the videos out there to people for free. Yes, I could make these videos and copyright them like I, I never made copyrighted videos, but I could put them on DVD like I used to do. There's three of them right there. But I decided years ago that I would bring this stuff out and put it out for free. And you can watch other videos where I talk more about that in detail. But we're going to start out here with about the knowledge of sin. Go to Romans chapter 3. Things that you can understand when you come to the Lord for salvation. As a lost person, there are certain things that you can get that you can understand. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. We'll begin there. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world is guilty before God when examined by God's laws. Verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why? You say, well, I can live by the Ten Commandments. I try to keep the Ten Commandments. Nope, can't make it. Only Jesus Christ was the only one that ever was able to keep the Ten Commandments, keep the law of God, and never break a single commandment. Man can't do it. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Look at this. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Knowledge of sin. I'm using Bible terminology here. Okay? A lost person that is self-righteous can be shown God's laws. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever dishonored your parents? Have you ever taken God's name in vain? Or whatever. They can be shown the laws of God and convinced very quickly. No, actually, all the world may become guilty before God. Verse 19. All the world is guilty before God because they broke God's laws. There is knowledge of sin there in every single man, woman, and child. Now, you get a child that's very, very young. Of course, they're not going to understand that they've sinned against God. They're not going to get that. But if you're a, a, a man or a woman, um, there's a knowledge of sin there. Go back to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. In other words, they don't have access to you know, the laws of the Old Testament. They're, they're just the heathen people out there, Gentiles there in the New Testament. It's speaking about people that did not have the written law, but yet they're doing those laws. Verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Your secrets are going to be judged one day by Jesus Christ. You say, by on what standard? The laws of God, you see. And anybody out there, unless they've killed their conscience, they will live by the Ten Commandments. I mean, 
Who out there wants their stuff being stolen? Who out there feels right about stealing someone else's things? Who out there wants to be lied to? I realize a lot of people do lie and things, but you don't like being lied to. You don't enjoy it. So there's a bit of conscience theory where you say, well, if I don't like being lied to, then I really shouldn't be lying to other people. You see? God's laws are written in everybody's hearts. And you have to kill your conscience to say, that doesn't bother me anymore. But you can talk to anybody. And I certainly have talked to a lot of different people in my life about eternity. And this is where it starts. If they don't admit to being a sinner, if they don't admit that, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty before God, I'm not going to tell them anything about getting saved. Well, God loves you and you can get saved and just believe. And, and, and No, 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 no. Self-righteousness has to die. You see, they have to admit that they know that they're a sinner. How about coming judgment? Oh, actually, we're, we got one other verse to go to here. I'll show you this one quick. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. Getting ahead of myself here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. <clears throat> down through verse 25. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The Ten Commandments there, the law of God, is there to convince you that you're a sinner. And after you're convinced of that, you realize, I can't get myself to heaven. No more self-righteousness. It's not, I think I'm going to get there and my good works are going to be outweighed and weighed with my bad works and hopefully if I have more good works than bad works, I'll get in. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. You come to the point where you're broken and you say, Jesus died for me because I'm a sinner. I can't get there on my own. And then you put your faith, you believe that he died on the cross and you put your faith in that sacrifice being enough to pay for your sins. It's very simple. All right. Secondly, we have coming judgment. Things that people that are lost can understand. You can show them all have sinned. You see up here. You're going to be judged someday for that. Coming judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. This is not going to be a real detailed, big, heavy, in-depth sermon. Very, very light but very necessary. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Yeah. Everybody dies. Unless God intervenes and catches that person away or takes the person up or whatever else. Unless there's supernatural intervention, everybody dies and everybody faces the judgment after they die. How do you know that? Just read it. Sorry, no reincarnation. You don't get to come back as a butterfly because you were nice to somebody in the past. Nope, doesn't work. Coming judgment. I'll show you another one. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. <clears throat> Verse 11 through 12. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I'm still going to have to give account of myself to God someday. I don't say, well, I got saved, therefore I can live however I want to live. I can just live wickedly and in sin and whatever, and I don't have to answer for it. Uh, no, I'm going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ someday. Okay, You read about that up in verse 9. But lost people are also going to have to be judged by God. Read about that back in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, the great white throne judgment. Every knee is going to bow, saved and lost. I chose to bow my knee now in this life. Lost people are saying, I'm not bound to Jesus Christ. I'll stand, thank you. I believe in myself. I'm a good person. I'm not that bad. I've never killed anybody. I'm not like Hitler or something. I don't believe a loving God would send people to mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. I've heard all the excuses after many, many years of being in ministry. All right. But the truth is, everybody's going to bow. Everybody's going to give an account to God. There is a coming judgment. 
in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Your secrets are going to be judged someday. Not only that, your thoughts. And every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, the Bible says. Judgment. Coming. Everybody understands that. There isn't a man, woman, or even a child out there that knows, that can say, I've never done anything at all that I want covered up. You know, everything I've ever done has just been perfect and right and good and, and I'm not ashamed of, of any of it. Everybody knows that they've done something that they wouldn't want to be judged for. That's why they get offended when a Christian says, you're going to go to hell. They get offended at that. Thirdly, we have Holy Scripture. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. There's a book that's written that people have died for, that people fight over more than any other book in the history of the world. And that book is this Holy Scripture right here. For English-speaking Christians, it's the King James Bible. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Turn back there. 1 John chapter 5, and verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, if you believe the Holy Scriptures then you have an assurance of where you're going to go when you die. You can know that you have eternal life. It isn't some kind of thing, well, you got to subscribe to this channel and you got to come and you got to support me at such and such rate every month and whatever else, and you have to come be a part of it. No, no. Uh, and, then you, and then you might get to heaven. No. If you have to be a faithful Catholic, you have to go to Mass and you have to make sure that you die in a state of grace as long as you don't have any mortal sins, just venial sins. Well, they can be kind of forgiven, but we'll have to do extreme unction when you die. Nope, nothing like that. You can know you have eternal life because of the Holy Scripture right here. The promises of God contained in a book. Well, I believe I'm a Christian. I believe I'm a Christian. You say, uh, do you believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word? No. It's just a translation. Oh, okay, then what is God's perfect word? Well, um, no translation can be inspired. Uh, then what God? what is God's perfect word? Well, the... Uh, Nestle's text, or the Textus Receptus, the Greek, the Greek, you know, the original Greek. Okay, um, which edition? The 28th, 27th, 25th, I got all three right there, Textus Receptus right here, Masoretic Hebrew, is, is that the Holy Scriptures right there, perfect, without error? Well, only the original autographs that were originally written. You see, there's a lot of people that profess to be Christians, and yet their God is an idiot God that wrote a book over the course of approximately 4,000 years, writes a book through all kinds of different people, and then their idiot God loses it or catches it up to heaven. He just takes the Holy Scriptures and just takes them up to heaven, and we're all left down here with poor copies, and none of them are perfect. And yet this idiot God of theirs is going to judge man by imperfect books. And yet they'll confess, and, and I shouldn't say confess, profess that they're Christians. And yet the very book that tells you what a Christian is and tells you how to be saved, they deny. Weird. Weird. <laughs> okay. So, what is the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Did a video on this not very long ago. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. You can watch my other video on the gospel. What is the true gospel? Get into the thing of Romans chapter 6 and comparing that to what's going on here. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which, also, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, verses 3 and 4 there are really the, the, the meat of the thing. 
Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Did you see the blood atonement there? You say, well, He died. Died for our sins. Sure, but it doesn't mention the blood. We understand that that's there. If you're saved, you understand that the blood atonement's there. Uh, unless you're John MacArthur. John MacArthur, uh, Jesus could have been strangled. It doesn't matter. It was just death. Uh, no, John, you're having to deny all kinds of scriptures that talk about the blood being very necessary. We're going to be going over a few here. Um, the blood atonement is part of salvation, but it's not something that you're going to understand right away. It's understanding that Jesus died. What's the significance of the blood? We'll talk about that here. But the blood is not mentioned in this passage. How about imputed righteousness? Is imputed righteousness mentioned in the gospel? Right here where the gospel is defined? No. How about sanctification? The changed life that comes after? No, it's not mentioned. How about Jesus Christ being 100% God? The deity of Jesus Christ. Is that mentioned here? No. How about eternal security? Is eternal security mentioned here? No, it's not. I say, well, then these have nothing to do with the gospel. Yes, they do. And what happens is, when you get somebody that's off in one of these five points down here, you'll realize they didn't really go through this up here. You see, the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, absolutely destroys self-righteousness. And the reason people don't go through this up here is because of the sin of self-righteousness. Everybody that's ever been lost and ever going to hell when they died, it's because they don't believe they're that bad of a person. If I had to stand before God, you know, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm, I'm not so bad. I mean, there's other people that are a lot worse than me. Self-righteous pride will damn everyone to hell. Okay? Now let's go through the things here. Blood atonement. The hidden things, the things that you understand after you get saved. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. See, it relates to this down here. Jesus Christ is 100% God. That's why his blood meant something. He's not just a man. Like the Jehovah's Witness uh, teaching is, that, you know, whatever else, or the, or the Muslims, they come out and they say, well, he was a prophet. Well, then his blood would have meant nothing, you see. He had to have God's blood. Just as simple as that. You say, well, how does a soul have blood? They don't. Well, then where did he get God's blood? Because he is God. He is the body of the Godhead. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. All right? Or excuse me, verse 9. Verse 8 talking about being, not being spoiled by philosophy, like the Trinity teaching. Okay? The blood atonement's there. And there's scores of scriptures that talk about the blood being there and being necessary. So when you hear a preacher saying the blood atonement is necessary for salvation, that doesn't mean that the blood atonement is the gospel. That's one of those hidden things of the gospel, of salvation, that you understand later on. You just understand, oh, Jesus died. He was buried and he rose again. If he didn't do those three things, salvation would not be possible through him. He saved us. Why? He died for our sins. Then he's buried. Well, okay. Um, Muhammad died for his beliefs, and he was buried. Buddha died for his beliefs, and he was buried. Did they come up? Nope. The fertilizer, worm food, over where they're buried. You see? Jesus died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again the third day. He has power over death. Therefore, he has power over our life and death. He is God. Only God has the power over life and death. I'm not God. You see, if some loved one of yours drops over dead, I can't go over to him and say, hey, stand up again. I bring, you know, life back in it. I can't do that. I'm not God. Hmm. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Like I said, I'm just trying to go through these quickly here. 
because I've done so many different studies on all these different points and whatever. First John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Is the blood part of your salvation? Yes. Do you have to believe in the blood, somehow put it up here, eliminate this stuff here, and say, it's the blood, it's the blood, it's the blood. That's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. It's part of your salvation, but you aren't going to understand the purpose of the blood and, and everything else when you come to the Lord as a sinner. All you can understand there is, I'm a sinner. Jesus died for me. Okay, I'm a sinner. I'll say it this way. I'm a sinner. I'm going to be judged for my sins. I can't save myself. The Bible says Jesus died for, my, for, for me and paid for my sins. You don't have to understand how the blood gets in there and how that it's God's blood and everything else and the blood washes away your sins and all the stuff back in the Old Testament and the you know, the killing of the Passover lamb and how that, you know, God himself shall provide a lamb for the sacrifice back with Abraham and Isaac. You don't need to understand all that stuff when you're coming to the Lord as a sinner. All you need to understand is, I'm a sinner. I'm going to be judged. Jesus died for sinners. It's simple. But if you get somebody that goes and says, I've done this, and then they reject the blood atonement like John MacArthur and like many of these other guys, and what's John MacArthur's problem? Where did he fail up here? He doesn't believe the Holy Scripture. He doesn't believe that this King James Bible is perfect. That's the whole point. He failed here. He might know he's a sinner. He might believe that there's a judgment coming, but he doesn't believe that there is such a thing as Holy Scripture. So he can go through and he can change words. And what well, the Greek says, and actually a better translation would be, he failed here, you see. So when you get somebody that fails up here, they're going to get messed up somewhere down here. Every single time. Next, we're going to talk about imputed righteousness. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 22. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. It's talking about Abraham in the passage here. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Interesting study because you can study it. God the Father raised up Jesus from the dead, but Jesus also says, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up. Jesus is God the Father. They're one and the same being. There's distinction there because God the Father is the soul. Jesus is the body. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit. Understand that. Verse 25 who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. We are sinners. We are going to be judged. The Holy Scriptures say that Jesus Christ died in our place. His righteousness, His perfect life can be given to you, imputed to you. You see? But you see how contrary that is to the wicked people up here that reject things because of their self-righteousness? You're so rotten and so filthy that a perfect man had to die in your place and then he had to exchange his perfect life for your mess of a life so that you could have a chance of getting into heaven. Of course, you do get into heaven. I'm not just saying chance, but you know what I'm saying. You're guaranteed that you're going to go there. It's eternal security. And again, see how the thing ties in with eternal security? Imputed righteousness... You're eternally secure. Why? Because it's not your righteousness that you're relying on to get you to heaven. Second Corinthians chapter 5. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Again about the imputed righteousness, righteousness here. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I am made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Interesting, too. God and Jesus are the same. Again, you see it there. We might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I thought it was the righteousness of Jesus Christ that's imputed to us. Yeah, it's the righteousness of God in Jesus. Hmm. 
nothing to it, of course. But you see, again, I'm a sinner. I have to come to Jesus Christ to be saved. You see, I can't do good things. There's no more self-righteousness there, in other words. I know I'm going to be judged. The Bible tells me that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was made sin for me, who knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Him, in Jesus, imputed righteousness. But you aren't going to understand that right away at salvation. You aren't going to understand all the details. That's stuff that the Holy Spirit's going to reveal to you later. But if you get somebody that says, well, I don't know about that. I believe we have to walk in holiness, live in holiness, um, all this other stuff, uh, follow Jesus in obedience and a sacrificial life of perpetual obedience. And we could fall away at any time if we get away from holiness and I could fall into sin and therefore lose my... See, if they mess with this imputed righteousness, they've not been up here. You see, they really don't have a real knowledge of sin. Their knowledge of sin is, I can save myself. When I sin, I can get to a point where I'm sinlessly perfect. You see, they don't need Jesus Christ's imputed righteousness. They have their own. Sure they do. Sure they do. Next, let's talk about sanctification. I'll show you the word here. John chapter 17, verse 17. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Hmm. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You mean to tell me that you can get saved and not believe this book? I don't think so. I don't think so for one second. But you're not going to understand manuscript evidence. You're not going to understand all the proofs of Scripture. There's stuff the Lord still shows me. I mean, I'm not, I've been saved now for quite a few years and been in full-time ministry for over 10 years now. Um, there's still things I'm learning. The sanctification process is lifelong. The changed life that God gives you, it's a continual thing of you're continually changing and the Lord's showing you more things and blessing you and whatever else. It's not that... I'm continually changing and at any time I can fall away. No, no, no. His imputed righteousness is upon me and it's changing my life more and more. Sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As long as I read this book, as long as I live by this book and the Lord convicts me on certain things I'm doing in my life and I say, you know what, the Bible says this and I, my life is doing the opposite, I better change what I'm doing so I can line up with this book. Yeah. Yeah. Romans chapter 12. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And you mean to tell me you're going to understand that back here when you're coming to the Lord as a sinner to be saved? You're going to understand that you've got to clean up all kinds of things in your life and what all the Lord expects for you and all this other stuff when you first get saved? I don't think so. Nope. All you know is, I'm a sinner. I'm going to be judged. The Bible says I can be saved. That's all you know. But after you get saved, sanctification and that changed life that follows is a part of your salvation. You can't deny that. You can't say, oh, there's no change. There's nothing that happens. Okay, then you're calling the Bible a lie. And you don't really believe. You don't really have a knowledge of sin. If you get saved and you can say, well, I can just continue doing the things I did before, my profession of faith... <laughs> Um, then you don't really have a knowledge of sin and the seriousness of it. And you don't really believe that you're going to be judged one day. I'm saved, I'm born again, but you know what? It's a fearful thing to me to have to think about answering for my life at the judgment seat of Christ as a saved, Bible-believing Christian in ministry. I'm going to have to answer someday. 
And I'm going to see a lot of my works, a lot of my things that I did burned up. A lot of times when I should have been studying the Bible and I was watching some stupid video on YouTube about car racing or some kind of deal like that or whatever else, a lot of times that I should have been witnessing and I kept my, my mouth shut because I was afraid. A lot of times I could have prayed. A lot of times I could have sung hymns and praises to God and I chose to sing worldly music. You see? I believe in coming judgment as a saved man and I have a knowledge of sin. It's part of the sanctified, changed life. I have to be a nonconformist. That's what we just read there. Be not conformed to this world. But how are you going to do that stuff? How are you going to understand all this stuff right here when you're coming to the Lord as a sinner needing help? You aren't going to understand it, but it is part of your salvation. You see? And it's not that something, oh, it's God just kind of hides it and then you get saved and he goes, oh, by the way. No, that's not it. You want a change. When you're up here, knowledge of sin, when you've messed up your life and your life has fallen apart and everything else, you want to change. You want a sanctified life. But you don't know how to go about doing it. You have a lot of questions that don't just don't make sense and things don't make sense in your life and whatever. You see? But God doesn't start to reveal that stuff to you till after you get saved. These are the blessings. The hidden things are Blessings. They're not surprise. Oh, surprise. I didn't want to tell you beforehand because it might you might not have gotten saved. No. They're gifts. These hidden things about the gospel, they come out and you go, Really? Wow, Lord, thank you. I didn't know that this thing I was doing was wrong. I'll quit that. I'll stop that. Thank you, Lord, for convicting me. Thank you for for putting these thoughts into my mind and whatever else. It's a wonderful thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, how are you going to understand that when you're up here? First getting saved. You're not going to understand that. It comes down here. There are still things in my life that change after all these years. Still things the Lord convicts me about and says, Hey, you know what? You shouldn't be eating that. Hey, you know what? You shouldn't be looking at that. Hey, you, want, you know what? You shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. A lot of things like that. And let me just say, let me make a, a statement here. I'll take it easy on somebody that doesn't quite understand some of the blood atonement stuff or doesn't understand imputed righteousness or sanctification or they don't understand the biblical Godhead teaching. They don't understand eternal security. I'm going to take it easy on a newly saved Christian because you see it could be about this right here the sanctification process. There could be some confusion there where they don't quite understand some things. And they say, you know, just something just, it seems like the Bible contradicts. And you, and you say, well, have you ever heard of dispensational teaching? No, what's that? And you explain dispensationalism to them and you say, you know, that the Bible's not just written to one group. It's written to people in the Old Testament there. And there's, in the, in the New Testament, you have, they're still in the Old Testament in the Gospels primarily. And then you have Jesus dying on the cross. And now the instructions to the church and, then you have people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Then you have the millennial kingdom. It's written to different groups. And they go, wow, I didn't know that. Process of sanctification, you see. So I take it easy on people that don't quite get some of this stuff here. They might be a little bit confused on some of these things because they've been listening to false prophets. But where I don't take it easy is when somebody's up here, they don't believe that they're a sinner. Our brother said the one time, he said, he likes to say to lost people, are you a dog? Do you consider yourself a, a filthy dog? You know, you do if you're a saved Christian. You look and you say, you know, like the Canaanite woman, she comes to the Lord and she says, heal my daughter. The Lord ignores her. And she says, Lord, please heal my daughter. And he turns to her and he says, you know, basically, you know, it's, it's not fit to give meat from the master's table to a dog. I'm paraphrasing there, you know, and she says, Truth, Lord. Do you consider yourself a dog? You know? <laughs> but see, somebody that fails up here, I don't know if I'm going to be judged. Don't judge me. Don't talk to me about that stuff. I don't believe the Bible. Okay, I'm going to be harsh on somebody like that. Somebody that's down here that says, 
I don't really know what's the deal with the blood or, you know, is, is, was it just a death or, the, you know, whatever. Imputed righteousness. I, I, do we have to work? Can I lose my salvation? What about the unpardonable sin? Things like, I'm going to be gentle with them. Sanctification, changed life. Again, a lot of my sermons people get mad about. It's about the sanctification, the changed life thing. I, you know, I don't, I disagree with certain things and whatever else. And I say, you know what, I don't think it's helping you as a Christian to eat, you know, just processed foods and, and to, you know, have insurance policies and mortgages and whatever. And people say, he's making it part of salvation. Well, it's part of sanctification, but I'm not going to say somebody's damned to hell that because they have an insurance, life insurance policy or something like that. I'm not going to say that. It's about sanctification. The Lord might convict you about some of these things. Maybe he won't. You see what I'm saying here? But somebody that's confused, that goes around there saying, you know, well, I believe that, that Jesus Christ is God, but what about the three persons thing? You know, they're saying God in three persons, you know, blessed Trinity, holy, 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 the old Christian hymn. Um, I'm going to have some mercy. I'm going to have some grace. There could be some sanctification issues there. Somebody that says, did I lose my salvation? I'm afraid of losing my salvation. I'm not going to jump on them if they've going through this up here, you say, well, let me show you some scriptures. Let me show you some scriptures. Let me show you some scriptures and some scriptures and some scriptures. You see? What I get one of the big lies about me is I'll talk about something like this down here and I'll say, you know, somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ being 100% God, they're not saved. And they say, well, then you're making this part of this. No, I'm not. I'm making this down here. That's why I'm doing this study here to clarify this thing. There are things down here that you're going to understand if you're truly, genuinely saved, you see. But when I see somebody messing around down here and they're not ignorant, they're not just newly saved or whatever else, they've heard the arguments, they're attacking one of these five points down here, um, then I look back up to here and I say, ah, self-righteous. They don't believe that they're a sinner. They don't believe that you should judge them. And they don't believe the Holy Scripture. They don't believe that this book, that the Scriptures here, they don't believe it's holy. It's just a translation. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So next let's go to number four. Jesus Christ is 100% God. Let me show you about that. And again, there's a whole bunch of Scriptures I've gone over in my Trinity Exposed studies on this. But... Uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 19 through 24. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me, hmm, nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. Where's your father? You don't know me. They asked for the Father there, Jesus. Why'd you say me? Because he is the Father. Okay, John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. Not in essence or substance or a divine unity. Or, they're one. One being. Again, if you don't know the truth about that, if you're new to this, Jesus is the body. God is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. Three parts of one being. All right? Um, verse 20. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and ye shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. What do you mean you're not of this world? You're standing there talking to him. What are you talking about? He's connected to God the Father in heaven. The soul is there. You know, the Bible says about a Christian that we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. No, that's not possible because, see, you're looking at me. How can I be seated together in heavenly places? Well, my soul is there, you see. So my body and my soul are separate. You say, explain all that stuff, how it works, draw it out or whatever. I can't. Stuff's, you know, a mystery. We don't quite get it down here. But I just read the scriptures and that's what it says. 
That's what Jesus is saying there. He's saying there, I am not of this world. Standing there as a regular flesh and blood man. And that's why they're confused and they're saying, what do you mean you're not of this world? You're just like us. You know, you have flesh, you have hair, you have teeth, you have eyes. We can, we're looking at you. You're wearing clothes just like we are. And you're not of this world. What are you talking about? It's talking about the Father. But look at this, verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. A lot of the false uh, trinity teachers, they'll, they'll come out and they'll say, well, he's talking about being the Messiah. You don't see that in the context. He's talking about the Father. And he says, if ye believe not that I am he, 100% God, you'll die in your sins. Well, I, I've, I've come along here and you see, I, I believe, you know, I'm a Christian and everything else, but I reject this. I believe in the Trinity, God in three persons, blessed Trinity and all this other stuff. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, even that doesn't, even though that God the Son and God the Spirit doesn't appear in the Bible. But I believe in the Trinity. I don't believe that Jesus is 100% God as far as, you know, being God the Father. I don't believe, then what's the problem? They don't believe the Holy Scripture. They have to go to the traditions of men, specifically the uh, clearest place for the teachings on the Trinity is right there, the Roman Catholic Catechism. All the words and all the terminology that these Trinitarians use comes right from there. Tertullian invented the word Trinity in the second century. If you look it up, proven fact. It's the most important doctrine of the Catholic faith, according to the Catechism. Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> you know, and I, and I get this other thing, you know. I mean, Jesus plainly says there, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Speaking about the Father. And I get this thing, some of these wingnuts, they'll come out and they'll say, wingnut is my word for saying lost, hellbound sinner that has no desire for the truth. They'll come out and they'll say, well... Uh, the, you see, that's back in the Gospels. Jesus was speaking there and things before he died on the cross, so it doesn't apply to us today. Uh, okay, then what do you do with this? Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 100% God, not a third, or one of three, but they're one of, he's one of three persons, but only one God. It's idiocy, this whole Trinity teaching. Finally, we have eternal security. Go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 4, start there. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. God our Savior, thought that was interesting. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. You see? You know that you're a sinner. You know you're going to be judged. Holy Scriptures save you. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, look at this, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. He saved us. They say, um, Brian, do you believe it's possible? You know, somebody says, do you believe it's possible I could lose my salvation? Yeah, I do actually. Because if it's your salvation, then uh, you don't really believe in the imputed righteousness. If you're worried about losing your salvation then I would suggest that you let God save you because then it's not up to you to lose it or to keep it. You understand what I'm saying here? He saved us. Calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved, you say, God, could you save me? It's not going to be an act of my own will of I'm going to just believe mentally. No, your free will comes in when you say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to be judged for those sins. The Bible says I can be saved. You see? My act of free will is coming to God and saying, God, 
can you save a miserable wretch like me? You save me. And when he saves you, then you can't lose salvation because it's his salvation that he provided for you. Understand? Verse 6, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What do we read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Hmm. Do you know you have eternal life? That depends on if you believe that you have Holy Scripture. All these people, I don't know, I the damnable doctrine of eternal security. I have it secrety. That did not, that wasn't spelled right. My spelling here. It's what happens when you talk and, and write. Okay? Security. There you go. All right. See? Not foul and not uh, infallible, not perfect. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, you know, all these people say the damnable doctrine of eternal security. Why? Because they don't believe in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. They don't believe that they're sinners. Well, I mean, at least in the general sense, they're sinners. But personal sins? Well, I'm not that bad. And when I get to the judgment, you see, it's not going to be that bad because I'm not that bad of a person. Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. One of the strongest verses on the eternal security issue. Ephesians chapter 1 beginning in verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. We're going to see about that later what that is. Dead and living saints being gathered together in one. Hmm. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things yet for the counsel of his own will. He saves you. He imputes his righteousness to you. His blood washes away your sin. He changes your life. Why? Because he's God. He has power to do that. And you're eternally secure. You are predestinated. Right? When he saves you, you are now in his hand. He has you. He's not going to lose you. You see. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. I've talked about that in many studies, so I'm not going to get into a whole lot of stuff here. But the whole point is, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are eternally secure. Till when? Um, till the redemption of the purchased possession. Many people call it the rapture. Okay, Rapture is not a Bible term. You should say the uh, catching up of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble would be the correct way to say it according to the scriptures. All right? You're eternally secure. You say, but that's, that's, you know, eternal security is not really that important. Oh, it's extremely important. John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Compare that to Ephesians chapter 1. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe that? You can't say yes to that if you don't believe in eternal security. If you don't believe in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, you can't believe that. If you don't believe Jesus Christ is 100% God, you can't believe that you're eternally secure. 
How can you? The blood, it was Jesus' blood. It wasn't God's blood. It wasn't the Father's blood. You see? Jesus is just a sub-God. See, if you don't believe he's 100% God, then he's less than that. And how do you really know the Bible's true? You see, you see all these problems that these people get themselves into? But what happens is, and I've seen this thing for years and years and years, when somebody gets messed up up here with the things that a sinner can know, that they can understand at the point of salvation, they get messed up here, they don't believe one of these three points here, they'll get messed up someplace down here. And there's a bunch more I could have made probably too from this lower list here of hidden things that are there. They're part of your salvation. But you see, these people up here, they'll get angry when you say, you know, if you don't believe in eternal security, then you're not really saved. They say, well, then I have to believe in Jesus and eternal security. They try to bring this up here. They try to take a hidden thing and make it a known thing. You see, I say, well, you know, John MacArthur, lost man. Why? Doesn't believe in the blood atonement. They say, well, then you have to believe up here. I didn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. Nowhere does the Bible say you have to, you know, ask God that the blood can be, you know, shed and all the others. You know, no, no. It's not about the blood. It's about Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And later on you understand, okay, it was, yeah, it was the blood that washed those sins away. You see? But the whole point is, the reason people come down here and they try to, because, you know, you say, well, how does lost people, how do they come down here? Well, because there's plenty of videos and plenty of books out there written by actual saved people that they can, lost people can go and they can steal some of this stuff here and try to say they have these hidden things, but yet they skip this up here. They're self-righteous. There's no repentance there. They don't believe that you should judge them. And they question the Holy Scripture and they twist the Holy Scriptures. Yeah. So, just wanted to put that together here and, and just kind of go over that stuff um, because I see a lot of this. Um, I do question people's salvation when they're messed up in one of these five points here, but I'm going to have a little bit of grace for them most times because I'm going to say, you know, is it this sanctification thing? Are they just kind of messed up a little bit because they've been listening to false, you know, teachers and ministries and whatever else out there? Uh, if they're messed up on one of these five points down here, a little bit of grace, but I'm going to look back up here then. And if I see they don't really believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word, uh-oh, failed there. They say, uh, I don't think you should judge me, and, and who are you to judge me, and you can't judge this ministry. All you do is expose people and whatever. Uh-oh, number two. I'm, I'm not a sinner. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't, repentance is a damnable doctrine. You don't have to you know, fail up here. And if they fail there, they're not going to get this. Just as simple as that. Do not be confused by the false prophets out there. All right. And again, understand. I'll show you one more verse of Scripture here. Kind of tie this whole thing together. This is not in my notes, but I think this will be a good one. John chapter 10, if you want to go there. I'm trying to see where the verse is at. John chapter 10, verse 4, we'll start there. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. You'll know when the Lord's talking to you through a ministry. Uh, it's not the Lord speaks through my mouth as far as, you know, I am God standing here talking to you. No, that's not it. It's just you'll say, yeah, Brother Brian, yep, he's lining up with what the Scriptures say. It's bearing witness to what, I, what the Lord's been showing me. Verse 5, And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. You will see that thing. You'll follow some kind of ministry sometimes. I've followed plenty of them over the years and, and liked some of their videos and whatever else. I think, wow, they really did a good job on that one. And then you listen to another thing that they say and you go, oh, something just doesn't sound right. Something about that voice just bothers me. You'll get somebody that might be teaching some right things down here, and maybe even some right things up here, might call themselves a King James Bible believer, 
but you'll see some self-righteousness. They'll get away from repentance. They'll say, don't judge me. Things like that. And then they'll get messed up someplace down in here. Listen to the Lord's leading when it comes to uh, who you're watching, who you're, who you're listening to. Look up what they're saying in the Scriptures. If what they're saying does not line up with the Scriptures, and the Holy Spirit starts to say, get away from that individual, listen to the Lord on that. Okay? A lot of false prophets out there, brethren. Lots and lots of them. Um, you got to stay in the Word of God. I will never point you to myself as your final authority. Never going to happen. Uh, and the enemies of the Lord will try to put that on you if you're a friend of this ministry. They will persecute you and say, oh, you just follow it, you know, what the this teaching because Brian Denlinger taught you that and whatever else. Um, I don't think so. So I keep talking on that whole thing, but I hope you've seen my point here. All right. So that is going to be it. Thank you for watching.